from the Sadhguru Center of a Conscious Planet created to enhance consciousness, cognition, compassion. We are proud to present Professor Dan Schachter. Dan Schachter is William R. Keenan Jr., uh, Professor of Psychology at Harvard University. Uh, Dr. Schachter received his PhD from the University of Toronto in 1981 and continued research there until joining the Department of Psychology at the University of Arizona in 1987. He was appointed professor in the Department of Psychology at Harvard University in 1991, and he served as a chair from 1995 to 2005. Dr. Schachter's research has explored the relationship between explicit and implicit forms of memory, the nature of memory distortions, and how individuals use memory to um, imagine future events and think creatively, and the effects of aging on memory resulting in over 400 publications. Dr. Schachter has received numerous awards for his research, including most recently the Fred Cavley Distinguished Career Contributions Award from the Cognitive Neuroscience Society, and he has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Schachter has authored several books, including Searching for Memory in 1996 and The Seven Sins of Memory 2001, both named as New York Times Notable Books of the Year and both winners of the American Psychological Association's uh, William James Book Award. He recently completed an updated 20th anniversary edition of the Seven Sins of Memory. So with that, I'm so proud and also looking forward to this talk. And uh, the main objectives of this talk, as uh, Dr. Schachter said, was to learn about cognitive and fMRI studies of remembering the past, imagining the future and creative thinking, to learn about approaches to manipulating the involvement of episodic retrieval processes in cognitive tasks that are not typically considered to be episodic memory tasks, and to learn about the relationship between these studies, approaches, and research on memory construction and distortion. Dr. Schachter, please take it away. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, uh, pleasure to be able to talk at this center, which seems to be up to some... Uh, exciting things. And I'm going to try to give you an overview today of some work that uh, it's been going on in my lab really primarily over the last 15 years or so, but it has its roots in an observation that goes back all the way to the 1980s when I was at the University of Toronto. And that observation concerned an amnesic patient who is known in the literature by the initials uh, KC. And the photograph of Casey on the left is as I remember him from the 1980s when I worked with him in Toronto. On the right is a more recent photo before, unfortunately, he passed away a, a few years ago. Uh, Casey had suffered a head injury uh, that uh, for, in a uh, motorcycle accident <clears throat> that resulted in damage to the hippocampus, medial temporal lobe, parts of the brain that we know are important for memory and a couple of other regions. And he uh, had a extremely severe amnesia as a result, although he was intact in many other respects. Uh, he could not remember a single episode from his personal past. In other words, he had a complete lack of episodic memory. And the relevant observations uh, for this talk came from a testing session that Endel Tolving, who was uh, my former mentor, PhD mentor at, at Toronto, and someone I work with uh, in the 1980s after I got my PhD in Toronto. The two of us were testing KC one day, and Tolving asked him a, a simple question, but it turned out to have a very interesting answer. He asked him, what do you think you'll be doing tomorrow? And KC uh, kind of responded by sitting there, scratching his head and basically saying, gee, my mind is blank when you, when you ask that question. So here's a, an actual uh, uh, snippet of the, of the protocol uh, that, that Tolving published in an article in Canadian Psychology. Here, uh, he refers to Casey as NN. He was referred to by a few different initials in the literature. He says, let's try the question about the future. After he said he couldn't think of anything, what will you be doing tomorrow? He smiles. He says, I don't know. Do you remember the question about what I'll be doing tomorrow? Yeah, he could remember over a few seconds. Uh, and then once again, he would say, uh, how would you describe your state of mind when you try to think about it? Blank, I guess. 
That was really striking to us because till that time, there was very little indication that a problem with remembering the past would translate to a problem with imagining the future. If you really pushed hard with KC, you could get him to say, well, maybe I'd have breakfast, then I'd have lunch after that. But he couldn't come up with any particular episode in the future any more than he could come up with a particular episode in the past. And that really struck me. Tulving wrote a little bit about it at the time. Uh, I made a couple of false starts in trying to study the relationship between remembering the past and imagining the future until uh, really 20 years later when, uh, when um, some events unfold that I want to mention. But um, I want to also emphasize that what was interesting about that uh, observation is that it suggested that episodic memory, which Tulving initially defined way back in 1972, that's a picture of Tulving there, uh, as the ability to recollect our, our past personal experiences is important for the future as well as the past. And then it was something I thought about for a long time. And finally, 20 years later, uh, a new postdoc ar arrived in my lab, a uh, person shown in the photo here, Donna Rose Addis, and she had recently gotten her PhD at the University of Toronto, doing some work on fMRI of autobiographical memory. And so uh, we talked about maybe using some of those paradigms, adapting some of those paradigms to look at the relationship between remembering the past and imagining the future in the brain. And so uh, the first study that we did together on this topic is it's kind of depicted in cartoon fashion here uh, from a, a figure taken from a, an article we published in Nature Reviews Neuroscience back in 2007 when we first did this work. And it just shows in, very, in cartoon form uh, kind of the basics of the paradigm uh, that we used. So the participant would be in the fMRI scanner. They would be given a cue and asked to either remember a past experience from the past few years. So here in the thought bubble on the left, the participant is thinking to themselves, I remember taking a day trip last summer and walking on the beach. That would be in response to a cue word such as vacation and instructions to remember an event from the past few years related to vacation. Uh, on, in the thought bubble on the right, the participant is thinking, I imagine picking out a puppy uh, at the pet shop next year. That would be uh, in response to a keyword such as dog and an instruction to imagine uh, an episode that could plausibly occur in the next few years in your personal future uh, involving a dog. And that's what they came up with. And so we we're interested in looking at brain activity in those two conditions. And we contrasted that activity to a condition in uh, to a control condition where they were given similar cue words and asked to carry out cognitive tasks that involved visual, spatial, and semantic processing, but didn't require them to either imagine or remember a specific episode. And the main result of that uh, study, I'm just showing you a part of the results here, we published it back in 2007, was striking similarity that was observed uh, when the participants remembered past events compared to the control condition and imagined future events. So what I'm showing you here is the similarity in midline regions that showed increased activity when people remembered the past and imagined the future. Um, that's the medial prefrontal cortex on the right, retrosplenial, posterior cingulate uh, on the left that showed that very similar activation. There are other regions as well that showed the strikingly similar activation. And there were some differences uh, between remembering the past and imagining the future, but this activation of these common structures is what was most striking. Well, based on that study, our own study, another study that was conducted at the same time in, uh, in uh, Kathleen Spooner's lab at Washington, uh, Kathleen McDermott's lab in, Washington University by Carl Spooner, and one other early PET study that did something similar uh, and produced similar results, we postulated the existence in, a, in the 2007 Nature Reviews Neuroscience paper of what we refer to as a core network that's involved in remembering past events, imagining future events, and perhaps supporting related kinds of mental simulations involving those midline regions I just showed you, the medial temporal lobe, 
which showed increased activity when people remember the past, imagine the future, lateral temporal cortex and lateral parietal cortex. And the cognitive neuroscientists among you may recognize that that uh, core network really overlaps substantially with what's known in the literature as the default network or default mode network, a set of regions that shows increased activity when we focus internally, remember the past, imagine the future, engage in various other kinds of cognitive activities, uh, internally directed cognitive activities. Um, that core network um, figure I just showed you was only based on a couple of studies. After uh, this work was published uh, from our lab and others in 2007, a lot more work uh, of a similar nature was done. And in 2007, Roland Benoit, as shown in the photo here, was a postdoc on my lab and led a, a meta-analysis where we, we were able to confirm this joint activation for episodic simulation, that is simulating or imagining future events and episodic memory on the basis of a much larger sample uh, of studies. So that seems to be a pretty reliable uh, observation. And it wasn't the only similarity uh, that uh, was established between remembering the past and imagining the future. I already talked about patient KC, but a couple of other studies at the time showed that KC was not unique. Various other amnesic patients who of course had difficulty remembering their past also had difficulties imagining their personal futures and constructing novel scenes in their mind, the work of Hassabis and McGuire on scene construction that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, there was work from my lab and others uh, that showed that when you gave those uh, cue words to older adults or patients with Alzheimer's disease and asked them to remember the past or imagine the future in a simple behavioral experiment and then um, scored the number of episodic details that they produce when they remembered the past or imagined the future, that is details about what happened, where it happened, when it happened, or when it might happen in the case of imagined future events, uh, that older adults, for example, showed uh, fewer, remembered fewer episodic details from their past experience than did younger adults, but they also imagined fewer episodic details in these constructed uh, or simulated future episodes compared to younger adults. And patients with Alzheimer's disease also showed a similar reduction in remembered episodic details and imagined episodic details in future events. So these kinds of observations or those that were available to us in 2007 led Addison and I in a couple of papers uh, to put forth an idea we, we have referred to as the constructive episodic simulation hypothesis. And the idea here is that episodic memory, which uh, again in Tulving's original rendition was uh, associated with recollection of past personal experiences, also plays a key role in allowing us to imagine possible future scenarios. We often refer to that as episodic simulation, running simulations of how future events might play out in our, in our minds based on our past experiences. And we argue that episodic memory did this by supporting our ability to flexibly retrieve and recombine elements of stored episode to, episodes to construct possible future episodes. Uh, we further argued uh, that this ability to flexibly recombine bits and pieces of our past experience into simulations of future event is adaptive when we're trying to use memory for purposes of future simulation, because after all, the future is rarely identical to the past, so we need to be able to simulate novel situations based on past experience. So an example of this would be imagine, you know, that you're trying to think of how you're going to deal with a, a difficult conversation that you, you have to have with a colleague in the next few days. You might think back to past experiences with that colleague um, and uh, think about how those might apply to the current situation. Or you might think back to uh, similar situations you've been in with other people and take bits and pieces of those remembered experiences and then kind of stitch them together into a novel representation and run a simulation about whether your approach to the situation is likely to be effective. Um, but we also uh, argued that this flexible recombination 
has a potential downside that if episodic memory is really set up to help us flexibly use the past to imagine the future, it might also result in memory errors when elements of past experiences are miscombined. And I'm not gonna say a whole lot about this in the talk today, but I wanna give you a couple of quick examples and I will come back to it at the very end of the talk, the memory distortion part of it. Um, we didn't have any evidence uh, on this point back in 2007 when we put forth this idea that flexible recombination that we use for simulating the future and other similar uh, kinds of event representations could result in memory errors. But in the past few years, uh, evidence uh, supporting this idea has emerged. Um, I'll mention one study that came from the lab of Stephen Dewhurst and his colleagues, uh, published a few years ago in the journal Memory Cognition, where they showed how imagining future scenarios could increase false memories in an experimental paradigm they refer to here as the DRM or de schrodinger mcdermott paradigm. That's kind of a standard paradigm in the lab for inducing a certain kind of false memory. I will tell you more about that paradigm at the end of the talk and some recent work that we've done uh, using it. Um, that's one line of evidence uh, supporting this notion from the constructive episodic simulation hypothesis of a a link between imagining the future, flexible recombination, and memory errors. And then another line of work comes from my own lab, slightly different here, a uh, slightly different approach where we've been able to show in some studies that were led by Alexis Carpenter, uh, shown in the photo when she was a graduate student in my lab, that the kinds of flexible recombination processes uh, that we use uh, to link um, people uh, make associations and inferences between people in distinct but related episodes. That's an adaptive thing that we're able to do, <clears throat> engage in what psychologists call associative inference. Uh, you know, just an everyday example of this, imagine that you're taking a walk uh, one morning and you see a um, 50 year old man walking a dog. Then the next morning you are walking also in your neighborhood, a different part of your neighborhood and you see a roughly 50 year old woman walking the same dog. If you think back to the episode from the day before, you can infer, make the associative inference that these people are probably related in, in some way, even though you never saw them together, but they're linked via the, the dog. What these studies with Alexis Carpenter was able to show is that when you're successful in making these kinds of associative, associative inferences, it boosts uh, or increases um, uh, your propensity to make source memory errors where you confuse uh, elements of uh, the context in which you uh, encounter uh, individuals in these experiments. Uh, so one of these is a purely cognitive experiment. Uh, that's the one titled Flexible Retrieval When True Inferences Produce False Memories. And then we've recently carried out an fMRI study that shows some of the brain regions that contribute to this memory error. So the again, the critical point here is that now there is emerging evidence that these flexible recombination processes that you use to take bits and pieces of memories, stitch them together, um, they're adaptive in some ways, but they can also lead to uh, memory errors. And more generally, this was the point I made in the, uh, when I wrote this book on the seven sins of memory back in 2001, that memory errors often reflect the operation of, of uh, adaptive processes that serve useful functions. And as Bala mentioned in the in introduction, I can't help and I can't help resist putting in a plug for the uh, 20th anniversary edition of the Seven Sins of Memory that was published a few months back in fall 2021, where I talk in a fairly accessible way about, about some of the work I'll, I'm talk, um, going into in this talk and some of this work uh, linking adaptive functions with memory errors, because that's a key element of the seven sins framework. Okay, back to the constructive episodic simulation idea. What I really wanna focus on in this talk is telling you uh, about some work that we've been doing where we've been trying to identify uh, some of the key cognitive and neural uh, mechanisms uh, underlying episodic simulation and thereby testing this constructive episodic simulation idea and see how it holds up in a variety of, of contexts. And the main way we've been trying to do this in my lab over the last decade or so um, 
is by manipulating the involvement of episodic retrieval in imagination tasks that we don't typically consider episodic memory tasks, as, as, as was alluded to in the introduction, in order to provide some of the relevant evidence. And I'm going to tell you about two different kinds of manipulations we've used to try to get at this question of uh, the use of episodic retrieval in these imagination tasks that we don't normally think of as, as memory tasks. One uh, a procedure that we call uh, an episodic specificity induction, and two, uh, a procedure some of you may be already familiar with known as a TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation. All right, episodic specificity induction, what is that? Um, we have defined this in my lab as brief training and recollecting the details of a past experience. And a lot of this work on episodic specificity induction uh, has been was led uh, by Kevin Medore uh, on the left and Helen Jing in the on the right when they were graduate students in my lab. They've si since moved on from the lab. Um, and for the purpose of, of developing this uh, episodic specificity induction, we adapted a pretty well-known procedure in cognitive psychology. It's known as the cognitive interview. And it was first developed by Fisher and Geiselman at UCLA back in the 1980s and 1990s as a forensic protocol that's been shown to increase episodic retrieval and eyewitnesses. So a cognitive inter in a cognitive interview, you're basically uh, putting people through a structured interview where you're trying to pull out as much episodic detail as you can about a recent event. In the case of Fisher and, Fisher and Geiselman, a recent event in which an individual witnessed uh, a crime. Um, but we're not so much interested, interested in it in, in, in using it in order to uh, uh, see what they remember about a recent event, what our subjects remember. Rather, what we're trying to do is use this adaptive, adapted version of the cognitive interview that we call our ESI, episodic specificity induction, uh, to look at its effect on downstream tasks. So the idea is, the logic is, as shown in the slide, is that by activating or biasing retrieval, episodic retrieval processes by putting people through the ESI, the ESI should have selective downstream consequences. It should boost performance on later tasks that draw on episodic retrieval, such as by our hypothesis, future imagining, will, while having little or no effect on subsequent tasks that we don't think would draw on episodic retrieval, such as describing a picture right in front of you, we wouldn't think that would involve episodic retrieval. So we want to see whether, in fact, we want to test our hypothesis that this induction is going to have a selective effect, not only on tasks, on tasks that require remembering a past event, but also other tasks that we think involve episodic retrieval, like imagining a future event. So uh, what do these inductions look like? So typically in these experiments, people first see a video. It's a video of people carrying out pretty routine activities in a kitchen. This is, it could be a video of anything. This is just a target event. And then there are two different kinds of inductions that we give them after they see two different versions of the video uh, spaced about a week apart. So they see the video and in the ESI, we now try to get them to unpack their memory for this video in as much detail as we can. So I want you to close your eyes, get a picture in your head about the people in the video you saw. I want you to think about what they look like, what they were wearing. Once you have a really good picture, I want you to tell me everything you remember about the people in the video. Try to be as specific and detailed as you can. Then we ask them uh, the same sort of uh, question uh, about objects and actions. So we're trying to get them to really crank up these detailed episodic retrieval uh, mechanisms. And we've got to, and we're going to look at the effect on downstream, uh, downstream effect on various tasks, but we've got to have something to compare that to. So we give them in a separate session, uh, uh, a spaced a, a week apart in our initial study, a control induction where they see a different version of this kitchen video. But now, instead of asking for detailed episodic retrieval, we just ask them for their general impressions of the video. Uh, what were your impressions of the people? Did you like it? When did you think the video was made? What were your impressions of the objects and the room and so on and so forth? 
So in both cases, they're thinking back to the video they just saw, but only with the ESI are we really cranking up these detailed episodic retrieval uh, mechanisms. And then in our very first study on this topic, uh, after they've had one or the other inductions, this is all manipulated within participants. So each person participates in both conditions, separated by a week apart, everything is counterbalanced. Um, they have three minutes to either remember a past experience related to one of these pictures. So they see pictures one at a time. Um, and for example, uh, if in the upper left, you see a picture of a beach, and now if in the memory condition, they'd be asked to remember uh, an experience related to that picture. Maybe, you know, my vacation last summer on Cape Cod, and they're given three minutes to remember it as much detail as they can. Or in the imagined condition, they're asked to imagine a possible future experience related to the picture. So there's a picture of a shopping mall. If they were in the future condition, they might be asked to imagine uh, going, uh, you know, to the shopping mall and tell us in three minutes, imagine, you know, as much in as much detail as you can, what might happen in that visit to the shopping uh, mall in the next few months or years. Uh, and then in the control condition, the, uh, they're asked simply to describe the picture. So if you look at the picture on the upper right, it's, there's, uh, you know, a man in a sport jacket, gray sport jacket, dancing with a woman uh, in a kind of purple uh, 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 top. Uh, they're in a room, there's a chandelier. You're just supposed to describe the picture in as much detail as possible. So the first two tasks, by our theory, both of them depend on episodic retrieval, but simply describing a picture we don't think has anything to do with episodic retrieval. Um, 24 young, 24 older adults, as I mentioned, they're two sessions sp spaced seven days apart. They see the video, get either the specificity or control induction, and then go on to do the three tasks we talked about. They come back a week later, they see a different version of the video, they get whichever induction they didn't receive in the first session, and then go on and do different versions of the memory, imagination, and description tasks. Uh, the coding of the data here is really important. So here we code the data using a procedure known as the autobiographical interview. This was originally developed by Brian Levine and his uh, colleagues in, in 2002. And it's just a way of kind of um, segmenting the details that people provide initially in, in uh, Levine's work in memory task, we extended to an imagination task. So there are two kinds of details here, internal details, in the memory and imagination tasks, those are basically episodic details. Uh, in the memory condition, who was there? What happened? Where did it happen? When did it happen? Or in the future imagining condition, you know, who is there in that imagined episode? What's going to happen? Where does it happen? When does it happen? So internal details are largely episodic details. External details for memory and imagination are comments they make, uh, inferences about what might have happened, facts related to the episodes. Uh, Non-episodic details, you can think of those as internal details or episodic details. For picture description, uh, internal details are just details that are physically present, perceptually present in the picture, and external details are similarly commentary, inferences, and related facts. All right, so what happened here? Uh, was very interesting. On the one hand, let's look at internal details as a function of whether people had just had the episodic specificity induction, that's the blue bars, or whether they just had the control induction, the impressions control induction, those are the gray bars. Let's focus on the left side first. With young adults, what you can see is after they've had the specificity induction, the blue bars are higher than the gray bars. In other words, they're remembering and imagining more episodic details uh, than, after, uh, than uh, after they had the control induction. But look at the description task, there's no difference between the two. So the episodic specificity induction, it doesn't seem to be just making these folks talk more, it's selectively boosting performance when they remember the past or imagine the future. The same is true for older adults, if you look over on, uh, in the right part of the slide they have fewer internal details in all conditions, which- No, I think I'm okay with-
in, I, in all, con uh, I think somebody's uh, audio is coming through here. Um, they they have sh they provide fewer internal details in all conditions than young adults, but like the young adults, there's a boost in internal details, the blue bars after the specificity induction for memory and imagination, but not for just describing a picture. And further, we see that there's no impact of the specificity induction um, on external details for any of the tasks in any of the groups. Older adults tend to provide more external details. They provide more kind of commentary about what's going on than younger adults, but it's not impacted by the specificity induction. So what's the conclusion? The episodic specificity induction, we think, dissociates the retrieval of episodic details during remembering, imagining from the retrieval of non-episodic information, those are the external details, and also from non-episodic narrative processes. Picture description has no impact on how you describe a picture that's right in front of you, but it does impact how you remember the past and imagine the future. Uh, we've extended this um, research from that uh, beginning. Uh, other studies have replicated our, our finding. McFarland and Sheldon replicated some of the findings I just showed you for imagining future experiences, remembering past experiences. We extended this to a domain that we call means and problem solving I'll, in several studies, um, as, uh, as did McFarland. And I'll just give you a quick example of what I'm talking about. Means and problem solving refers to problem solving having to do with everyday situations where you're trying to figure out how do I deal with a like a personal issue that I'm, I'm trying to um, uh, trying to address. So I'll tell you about one study that was led by uh, uh, Helen Jing uh, that had to do with means and problem solving and the role of episodic retrieval in the simulation of worrisome future events. So we all know from everyday experience and research has confirmed that worry about the future can be detrimental to psychological well-being. And in this study led by Helen Jing, uh, what we did was manipulate the amount of detail with which people simulated worrisome future events in their future with the ESI, trying to boost the amount of episodic detail, as I just showed you, to examine whether increased episodic detail during simulation produces benefits in addressing a worrisome personal problem and also in emotion regulation. So here's a quick look at the experiment. Uh, the initial phase involved the collection of worrisome problems or events from our participants who are Harvard undergraduates. And we asked them first to list 30 specific concrete problems or events that are highly worrisome to you and we thought they might have trouble coming up with 30 events that worried them, but it turns out the, uh, these students unfortunately are worried about a lot of things. And so they had no problem coming up with 30 problems that they worried about. So an example would be, they would say, well, I'm worried about doing poorly on the final for my psychology class because that would bring down my GPA. And they'd come up with other examples like that. Then we'd say, what's the positive outcome you hope will happen for this event? be, oh, I get an A on the final. And what's the negative outcome you fear would happen for this event? I fail the final and it brings down my grade in the class. So then they would come back and uh, we, after collecting these events, and we give them either the episodic specificity induction, as I just described in the other study, or that impressions control induction. And then they go on to do a what we call a personal means and problem solving task. That's a modification of a classical means and problem solving task uh, that was originally developed by Platt and Spivak. And these are brief personal problem stories, six of them, where you have five minutes to try to generate steps to reach a positive outcome for your personally worrisome problems. So the way these are formed is as shown on the slide, uh, you'd like to do well on your uh, upcoming psychology uh, uh, final exam. The story begins with you worrying about your psychology final. We know they're worried about it. Now the story ends with you getting an A on the final. So the means end part comes with us asking them to fill in the middle of the story. How do you get to this happy ending of getting an A? You've got to now generate uh, 
steps that will constructively help you to solve this problem. And what we were able to show in Helen's study is that having just had the ESI increase the number of steps that are judged to be relevant to solving the problem and decrease the number of irrelevant steps uh, as shown in the slide. So they're coming up with more relevant steps after, the, after they've just had the ESI um, uh, versus the control induction. Blue bar is higher than the uh, red bar. And for other irrelevant steps, uh, it doesn't, it, it, if it shows a, a slight decrease after ESI. So it's helping them to really hone in on a productive solution to their worrisome problem. Um, we also found that participants showed greater decreases in negative affect toward the worrisome event after ESI, uh, suggesting that these more detailed episodic simulations enhanced emotion regulation and aspects of well being. All right, so we've talked about imagining future experiences, means and problem solving. Now I wanna say a few words about some recent work on divergent creative thinking and how that relates to episodic retrieval and to the episodic specificity induction that I've been telling you about. So what is divergent creative thinking? Um, it's the ability to generate creative ideas by combining diverse kinds of uh, types of information in novel ways. Uh, and it contrasts with convergent uh, thinking, convergent creative thinking, where you're honing in on a single solution to a problem. Um, it was originally defined by Guilford back in 1967. And there were a few lines of evidence out there that uh, suggested that episodic retrieval and simulation contribute to this form of creative thinking. Uh, so... For example, on the alternate uses test, which I'm gonna tell, uh, tell you about more in a, in a minute, it's a standard test of divergent thinking where you have to think of, come up with novel uses of common objects. The number of episodic details that people provide when they simulate future events is positively correlated with the generation of appropriate uses on the AUT. That's a couple of studies from my lab, one initially led by Donna Addis and recently re uh, replicated and extended in some work led by Preston Thackrell. There's also evidence that medial temporal lobe amnesic patients who have episodic memory impairments, they also have, in some cases, semantic memory impairments, uh, perform poorly on tasks that, diver uh, that tap divergent creative thinking. And there's some uh, evidence of activity in the medial temporal lobe and other core ne network regions has been involved during the AUT. So uh, I would say this is suggestive but not conclusive evidence that episodic retrieval contributes possibly to divergent creative thinking. So naturally, we wanted to give a stronger test of this uh, by seeing whether our episodic specificity induction would boost uh, performance on uh, tests of divergent creative thinking. So we predicted that our in episodic specificity induction in fact would selectively enhance performance on a divergent thinking task, the alternate uses task, uh, versus a control task, an object association task that requires little divergent thinking, where you just have to come up with familiar associations to an object. So let's uh, talk about this study. It was published a few years back in uh, Psychological Science. Uh, 24 young adults in this study, um, it was replicated in a second experiment. It's the same setup, more or less, as I just told you about for the earlier studies. You see the video of people doing stuff in a kitchen. You get either the specificity induction or a control induction. Then you do the AUT that I'll tell you about in a minute and the, or the object, and the object association task. And then in a separate session, you see a different version of the video do whichever induction you didn't do in the first run through, and then do uh, different examples of the AUT and object association task. Okay, the alternate uses task, what exactly is that? Well, here what you've got to do is generate unusual and creative uses for five everyday objects. Guilford was the one who initially developed this task many years ago. Um, so for a coin, I might say, come up with as many novel uses of a coin as you can think of, and that's scored for total uses, uh, which uh, would be the total number of appropriate uses. So whether it could actually work, and another uh, 
measure, that's the fluency measure and known as the fluency measure of the alternate uses task. And the measure that we relied on most in this initial study is called the flexibility measure. It's very similar, but now we're, we're gonna score for categories of appropriate uses, uses that fit under a category that's also appropriate. So for coin, for example, if you said, well, you could use a coin as a chip in a board game, that would count for one use. And then if you gave, um, if you gave 10 different examples of board games where you could use a coin, that would count for 10 under the fluency criterion, but only for one under the categories of appropriate uses or flexibility criterion. Um, that's what I just said. Um, and for the object association task, uh, you would generate uh, objects that are to totally, uh, typically uh, associated with one of the five objects, like coin, come up with some familiar associates. So what happened here is that if we look at uh, the uh, flexibility measure on the right, that's the categories of appropriate uses, a measure of performance on the AUT. Indeed, we do see a significant boost. They come up with more categories of appropriate uses, novel uses of objects, and for they've just had the specificity induction as compared to the control induction. But there's no effect on the object association task. So again, there's a selective effect of this specificity induction on the task that we think draws on episodic retrieval. Based on these kinds of behavioral data for the imagine the future task and the divergent thinking task, we expected that some of the core network regions that were previously implicated in episodic simulation and retrieval would be influenced during imagination and creativity tasks by a prior ESI. And indeed, we have now found, uh, reported these results in a couple of different studies. One published back in 2016, honed in on uh, future imagination. So you would uh, get a non-scanned ESI, episodic specificity induction or a control induction. And then we would uh, do scanning while you either imagined a personal future event in response to a keyword or performed a control task, a what we call the objects control task. We've used this as a control task in a bunch of our studies of imagining the future where you get a, uh, a keyword and now you have to generate a sentence uh, that includes the keyword and two related object words in a uh, kind of order of the size of those objects. You also define each word. So it's a task that involves both some spatial processing and some semantic processing, but does involve imagining a personal future uh, episode. Um, and we were able to replicate our previous behavioral results. The critical thing here uh, hap, uh, emerges when we look at the brain maps following ESI and following the control induction. And you can see just by eyeballing them that you get robust activity in a lot of those core network regions that I showed you earlier from the 2007 study. There's a nice replication here of those results. But you can also see that following ESI, there's more activity you can see by eyeballing it in the vicinity of the hippocampus on, in the right upper scan compared to the control induction. And indeed, when we do a tighter contrast where we now ask the, ask the question, what brain region showed increased activity when you imagined the future versus the control task and also showed increased activity following ESI uh, versus the control induction, it was a region in the left anterior uh, hippocampus, a region that's been implicated previously in episodic uh, retrieval, uh, also a region in the inferior parietal lob lobule and the precuneus regions that have also been implicated in episodic retrieval. These were the ones that showed increased activity when you imagined a future event following ESI versus the control induction. Uh, we can tell a similar story for divergent creative thinking, where we examine the impact of ESI on the alternate uses task that I just told you about in the behavioral study and also the object association task. And what we found is that same left anterior hippocampal region showed increased activity when you're doing the AUT, coming up with novel uses of objects after the specificity induction compared to the control induction. 
We also see a couple of uh, regions that we might think of as cognitive control regions, uh, the uh, left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and left ventrolateral prefrontal cortex showed this increased activity after specificity versus control uh, when you're doing the alternate uses uh, task. Uh, and we also did in this study uh, arresting state connectivity analysis where subjects are just sitting in the scanner uh, this is frequently used in fMRI studies nowadays and, and for the past uh, decade or two, and ask the question of whether there are any changes in the connectivity of brain regions following specificity induction versus control. And indeed, we found increased connectivity between this left anterior hippocampal seed, a region in what we've called the core network, and one of the control regions uh, in the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. They showed increased that, uh, connectivity following ESI versus control. That was of interest because in a review paper that I co-authored with Roger Beatty and a couple of others published in TICS back in 2016, we noted that one of the kind of signatures of creative cognition uh, was an increase in default, in connectivity of default network and executive control regions. And so we saw a little bit of that following the ESI in the study that I just told you about. Okay, I want to get toward the end of my talk by saying a few words about some work we've done with transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS as another way to manipulate the involvement of episodic retrieval in imagination and creativity tasks. So probably many of you know that TMS uh, involves uh, mag magnetic stimulation that can disrupt normal activity of the brain. It creates kind of a temporary virtual uh, region with no harm to the subject. Uh, and the TM uh, TMS pulse uh, directly alters neural activity in a, an area of approximately one uh, centimeter cubed um, that is directly underneath where you're applying the pulse, but we'll also see that there are some indirect effects that are of interest here. Uh, we got started on this in a study that Preston Thackrell led, we published in Journal of Neuroscience a few years back, where using some of the procedures that I've already told you about, we were able to show uh, in Preston's study that inhibitory TMS to the left angular gyrus, which is part of the core network, an important part of it, compared to TMS to a control region, the vertex, produced similar reductions in internal or episodic details on subsequent tasks in which participants were asked to remember a past experience or imagine a future experience. So if you get TMS to the left angular gyrus and then after the TMS, we run you through these remember the past, imagine the future uh, tasks uh, using uh, word cues in, in ways similar to what I've told you about already. Uh, what you see is that people remember and imagine episodes with fewer episodic details after they've just had inhibitory TMS to the angular gyrus, and yet that TMS had no effect on external details, kind of commentary related facts, as I talked about earlier, and had no effect on the control task in this study, which was a semantic free association task, similar to the object association task that I told you about earlier. So. We think this provides some nice converging evidence uh, for here, a role of the uh, left angular gyrus and similarly supporting episodic simulation and memory. Uh, more recently, um, we took advantage of an interesting uh, observation that was made in a science paper uh, from Joel Voss's lab, the Wang et al. study shown on the slide published back in 2014, they were able to show that applying TMS to the angular gyrus also impacts connected regions, including the hippocampus. So they're part of the same network, and they were able to show that when you, uh, you inhibit uh, the angular gyrus, there's some downstream activity in inhibition in the hippocampus. So we used an fMRI-guided uh, TMS approach, uh, again, applying the stimulation to the left angular gyrus, but now tracking with fMRI, whether it's producing uh, an inhibitory effect in the hippocampus in an attempt to modulate activity in the hippocampus during 
both episodic simulation, imagine a future event, and divergent thinking, the alternate uses task that we've talked about already. Uh, this is, was written up in a paper published in PNAS in 2020. Uh, and in separate sessions, um, uh, we applied a particular kind of TMS known as continuous theta burst stimulation or CTBS to either the angular gyrus or this control site in the vertex just before task performance during fMRI scanning. They didn't get the TMS in the scanner, they got it just before, but the inhibitory effect lasts long enough that you can pick up the consequences while subjects are in the scanner. Word cues were presented during scanning and participants imagined a future event, generated alternate uses as we've already seen on the AUT or performed that sentence generation control task I told you about earlier. Details of imagined experiences were encoded into internal and external as I talked about before and uh, alternate uses performance was scored for fluency and flexibility exactly as I told you about before. What happened? Well, again, we get a, a nice replication and extension of our uh, previous results in that if you look at internal details when they're simulating a, a future event, that's the upper left, uh, upper left part of the figure, you see fewer internal or episodic details are produced after angular gyrus uh, CTBS than uh, to the control region. Whereas on the control task, there's no effect on internal details and there's no effect whatsoever on external details. That replicates our previous results. We also see now that applying the uh, CTBS inhibitory uh, uh, stimulation to the angular gyrus reduce both fluency and flexibility significantly when they're doing the AUT. So it's a nice replication and extension of the behavioral results. Importantly, we're able to show here that hippocampal regions showed a task by CTBS site uh, interaction, such that there are regions in the hippocampus that show decreased activity after stimulation to the angular gyrus when their people are doing the simulation task, imagine the future, when they're doing the alternate uses task, but no effect during the control task. And this reduced hippocampal activity during divergent thinking and episodic simulation was linked to performance reductions. So uh, there's one caveat, although we observed these effects in the hippocampus, we saw similar effects in a few other core network regions. So we can you know, firmly claim that the observed effects only involve uh, hippocampal dependent processes, but they surely do involve uh, the hippocampus, possibly some other regions as well. So we think that nicely extends some of the earlier work. Now, I realize I'm running out of time, but I just wanna go back briefly to the issue of memory errors. We've talked a lot now about divergent creative thinking and involves flexible episodic retrieval and simulation processes. Following from the constructive episodic simulation hypothesis, we ask whether creative thinking might also be associated with memory errors, because remember, that's a key part of that hypothesis. Uh, this is another paper where uh, Preston Thackrell took the lead for those who might want to read about it. It's published in the journal Cognition a few months ago. And this is where we use what's known as the DRM, D. Schrodinger McDermott task that I talked about earlier. What is that? Well, this is a very simple and standard way of inducing false recall and false recognition in uh, healthy individuals. So the way this works is you get a list of associated words, candy, sour, sugar, bitter, good, taste, etc. And then later on, you're tested with words from the study list like taste. So you should say, on a recognition test, yeah, I remember taste was there. We throw in some unrelated words that weren't presented like point. And most people, if you've just heard the list, candy, sour, sugar, bitter, et cetera, will easily say point was not part of that list. Where things get interesting is with the associatively related theme word or critical lure word, sweet. People will claim with very high confidence that they heard the word sweet in that initial list, even though it was not part of that list. You get very high levels of false, relearn, false alarms to the critical lure or theme word accompanied by high confidence because it's associated to all those words that you did here. And people will produce 
the theme word about 40% of the time. These are some old data from a, a study in my lab led by Ken Norman showing that young and older adults show uh, very high levels of false recognition. Those are the data on the right claiming like 70, 80% of the time that sweet was on the list when it wasn't and recalling it on its own 40% of the time. The question we're interested in is does the tendency to make those false recall and recognition errors, is that correlated with or predicted by uh, performance or does it predict performance on the alternate uses test? Are people who make a lot of those false memory responses, did they also come up with a lot of uh, novel uses when we measure fluency and flexibility? In this study, we combine them into a qual uh, quantitative measure of uh, divergent creative thinking. And the simple answer was, yeah, they're in two different studies and we've replic replicated it again since, we found a that DRM false recognition and also false recall were correlated with and predicted by quantitative divergent thinking as I'm showing you in the graph here. So people who were better on the divergent thinking task came up with more novel uses also were more prone to DRM, false recognition and false recall. And we didn't observe any of such effects for true recall or recognition or for qualitative divergent thinking. All right, so a couple of quick conclusions. I realized I'm pretty much out of time. Uh, we've seen that both, positive, uh, both cognitive and neuroimaging evidence support the idea that episodic retrieval and recombination play a key role in simulating future experiences. Uh, and contribute importantly to observe similarities between remembering the past and imagining the future. Similar episodic retrieval and recombination processes contribute to means and problem solving we saw and divergent creative thinking. And we've also seen that these adaptive episodic retrieval processes may also contribute to or be associated with memory errors. Finally, I just wanna thank my funding sources, collaborators, uh, members of my lab, and thank you for your attention and for coming to the talk today. And that's Dan, thank you so much. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you so much for your um, wonderful levels of work. And it seems like you've done a lot of work in building this um, science and uh, really fascinated by that. Uh, before we allow others to ask questions, I just have one question to you. Can you give just an overarching, maybe a minute of uh, the seven sense of memory? I know I'm oh, yeah. just pushing you there because of the, what what is the gist about? Yeah, well, the seven sins of memory were basically my, my attempt to kind of looking at the literature on memory errors 20 years ago or a little over that for the first time and realizing that psychologists and neuroscientists were aware that memory is prone to error, is to try to classify the different ways in which memory can uh, cause problems. So three of the seven sins have to do with different kinds of forgetting. I call them transience, absent-mindedness, and blocking. Transience refers to forgetting over time. Absent-mindedness refers to a breakdown at the interface of attention in memory that results in forgetting, kind of like, where did I just put my keys or glasses a minute ago? The information hasn't faded out of memory, but there's a breakdown between attention and memory. And blocking refers to situations in which information is still in memory, you're paying attention, you're trying to remember, but the inf you can't come up with the information you want at the moment that you need it, like a tip of the tongue state that would be blocking. So those, those, those are three sins of omission. And then there are four sins of commission when memory is present, but it's either wrong or unwanted. So misattribution, that would be like the DRM false memory error. Uh, you, remember, you may remember some aspect of an event correctly, but you get the source of it wrong, or you remember the gist of the event, remember semantic, you know, you remember that you heard all these words that had to do with the word sweet, but you never heard the word sweet, uh, but you misattribute your strong sense of familiarity with that word to having heard it in the list. So that would be an example of misattribution. Suggestibility, <clears throat> that refers to situations where misinformation is implanted in our mind and we re 
remember maybe an entire false memory of an event. <coughs> and bias refers to uh, memory distortion produced by our current knowledge, um, uh, assumptions, feelings, and beliefs, where what we currently know, believe, and feel skews or biases our memory of past events. So three different kinds of memory distortion. And then finally, the final, the seventh sin I call persistence. And this refers to intrusive recollections that we can't get out of our mind that typically occur after uh, upsetting or, or even traumatic events. And a big point I made in writing about the seven sins is that they may seem like um, flaws in the structure of memory, but I try to make the argument that consistent with what I uh, presented in the talk today, that uh, a lot of the, that, that most of these seven sins are really byproducts of adaptive processes in memory that make it w work well most of the time. So that's a little just summary of what the seven sins are all about. Thank you. Are there any parallels between meditation and episodic uh, stimulation? Well, it's an interesting question. I, I think both, you know, uh, both um, involve an inward focus. I guess in meditation, one is really, one has a, you know, uh, one is trying to have, have a clear or focused mind. In episodic simulation, we're filling up our minds with imagined events. So I think they both involve looking inward, but with uh, episodic simulation where, you know, our minds are really heavily populated uh, with uh, imagined events and where we're trying to figure out ways of approaching future events. Meditation, I, I think of as being more present oriented and more, more focal. Great, I'll let others ask. Thank you so much for your time and the talk. Hi, this is Suganta Sundar. I'm a, also an anesthesiologist. Um, having worked in the trauma ICUs, sometimes we see patients with like similar injuries, head injuries. Some of them have memory loss and some don't with the exact same thing. So how do we sort of figure out like what is the prognosis for this patient who has similar sort of, you know, injuries but is exhibiting this huge memory loss, whereas another patient in similar sort of category has no issues at all. So how do we sort of reconcile that? And what is it sort of, is there any future research for that to help these patients? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that would depend on really putting together a good neuropsychological assessment. If there's imaging available, trying to combine those things and trying to understand, you know, from, from that information, why one patient might be doing well and another patient is, is not doing well. Um, you know, I think combining as many sources of information as possible uh, is useful in, in trying to un understand these things. And boy, there's long history of work on, on memory remediation and rehabilitation, and that would be a whole other long talk. But um, there are things that can be done for patients, but typically what's been less successful or not really been successful have, have been attempts to restore memory in some general sense, like by having them go through some sort of uh, cognitive training protocol with the idea that, you know, memory is a muscle and if you just strengthen that muscle, it'll come back. That generally doesn't work. What does work are more targeted approaches to trying to, um, you know, to trying to bring out, uh, make use of what preserved abilities the patient has and trying to use that to maybe teach them very specific knowledge that could be helpful to them in a particular domain of everyday life or training them to use external memory aids uh, in, in an effective manner uh, is something that the literature has shown to be helpful. So there's a, there's a much longer story on that, but there are things that can mm -hmm. be done, but um, mm -hmm. not everything works. Thank you. Dr. Shakta, we have a few more questions from okay. the audience coming in. Um, Jeffrey Greenspan, are you able to unmute and, and share a question? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, you mm -hmm. can ask, you can ask okay. one question in the interest of time. Okay, thank you for an excellent talk. Um, I had questions that were directly uh, related to your experiment and questions in your field. 
And for the purposes of time, I think it's better to ask the questions directly related to your experiment. Um, in that case, uh, I don't, th the hypothesis I think you're getting at, although you didn't state it absolutely, is, is that Im imagining future events is dependent on subconscious scanning of past experience in some way. Um, I hope I'm interpreting that as a possible hypothesis. I wouldn't uh -huh. use my, myself, I wouldn't use the term subconscious scanning and I wouldn't turn it into an issue of conscious versus not conscious. But okay. I, yeah, the spirit of it is that you're taking bits and pieces of the past and you're putting them together into but some novel construction. It's dependent on it. It's, it's yeah. future imagining. So let me ask yes. questions that have to do with the methodology. Um, two questions that are uh, related. When you ask a viewer simply to say whether he or she liked the video, which was sort of your control group, how do you know that they are not actually subconsciously recalling specific details of the video and thus activating retrieval mechanisms? And the other question is, does it make a difference whether the picture shown to the subjects in the event is an event that never happened to the viewer or whether that picture replicates an event that the viewer had experienced? Oh, you mean the, pic the pictures uh, that we used as still. cues for the various tasks? Yeah, the still pictures. Yeah, the still pictures. Okay, first, uh, a good question about about the uh, about the control uh, impressions control video. How do you know that maybe there's not some episodic retrieval going on there? Two responses to that. One is that we get the same results when we use a different control test where the subjects do just do math problems, ah. um, and they don't they don't do the impressions control. That we get the same contrast between that and the specificity induction as between impressions control and specificity. Second, if they were doing that, that would work against our hypothesis. If there was some subconscious uh, retrieval or rehearsal of episodic details in the impressions control, that would work against finding a difference between impressions control and episodic specificity induction. So you can't totally rule it out, but the differences we observe between the two uh, conditions, two inductions, would be occurring despite anything along the lines what you suggest might. I don't think it's occurring, but it could be. You can't rule it out totally. But the fact it works it would work against us finding right. the differences okay. that we did, and uh, and then we find the same results when we use a different uh, control induction, just math problems instead of impressions control. But uh, fair fair points. And then on the last question. Uh, they're all kind of everyday scenes that the the uh, pictures that we use aren't taken from you know anybody's Instagram or or Facebook or personal photos. They're just generic photos. Probably and most did people. Think, did you ever think of doing an experiment wh where one group sees pictures that could not they could not have possibly experienced, and another group sees pictures that relate to things that they have experienced to look for differences. <laughs> Yeah, um, it, it would be. Uh, people have done some things along those lines. You'd probably have to do some work to find pictures of, of things that, you know, they could not have experienced. But I, I see the issue that you're getting at. And um, the, the work, that that work that is out there suggests that you're still able to draw on your episodic memories to come up with these novel um, related uh, experiences, to come up with these novel simulations, even for you know situations that you are less likely to have had direct experience with you're still able to flexibly use your past experience to construct simulations of those uh, more novel experiences even though we haven't specifically manipulated in my lab but it's a good question thank you very much thank you so much for those questions uh dr Schachter, we have one last question from an audience member uh, her name is Mary Jo Martin, and her question is, there was a slide that showed increased performance by older people versus younger. Could that be a result of more life experiences? Well, it could. The, the, I think the slide um, that she's referring to uh, was where older adults tend, to, in, in the tasks that we use, remembering the past, imagining the future, or even just describing a picture in front of them, tend to produce more external details that's commentary facts sometimes it's more what some people would call going off topic where people start uh, to for lack of a better word rambling a little bit when they're talking about their past experience 
uh, or imagined future experience or the picture that's right in front of them. So that's what older adults do more of. And yeah, uh, you know, that probably is related to having had more life experience, but it's a contrast with and maybe maybe gets in the way of their ability of the remembering the specifics of the experience or imagining the specifics of the future uh, experience. So, yeah, I think that that increase in older adults uh, tendency to produce external details could be related to more life experiences, somewhat also related to uh, what have been called age, uh, age related problems with inhibiting irrelevant information, because a lot of those external details aren't really as relevant to the task, uh, although they may be interesting. Older adults, you know, in these tasks might tell a more interesting story about an imagined future event or a remembered past event than the younger adults do, but that's because it's composed more of these external details, facts, commentary, uh, than the actual episode core of the experience. Thank you so much, Dr. Schachter. I see that you left a note for me that says you wanted the MRI experiment uh, question, and I didn't see it at first. Do you want me to quickly ask the MRI question? Uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, I mean, it's the one you reckon. Okay, um, I'm hoping I'm, this is the one that you wanted. Uh, this is the question as I submitted it. Uh, recent fMRI studies have concluded that the brain actually registers the level of certainty of a memory, as well as the memory itself. Can you elaborate mm -hmm. on this finding? This came out of NYU, I believe, um, and it was published in the journal Neuron, I believe. Yeah, I'm not sure which study that is, but you know, we did some work on that in, in my lab uh, back about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, showing some distinct neural correlates for confidence and, uh, and the actual, uh, remembering of the event i don't i don't know which exact study that you're referring to from the neuron paper but certainly cognitive studies have shown that confidence and in a memory and the accuracy of that memory can be dis pulled apart can be dissociated under certain conditions they often go together but they sometimes dissociate, and that's when we get in, into interesting situations where people have high confidence, false memories. So it makes sense that there might be, to some extent, distinct neural correlates uh, uh, of, of the two. And in our older study, uh, we, we did find some uh, evidence al along those lines with some prefrontal regions more uh, associating with confidence than with uh, accuracy. But I can't comment on the neuron paper that you're referring to because I, I have I don't think I've read it thank you very much thank you so much Dr. Schachter and thank you everyone for joining us for this very fascinating talk Dr. Schachter I don't know if you're see, getting any chat messages but I my chat is filled with messages that are saying very interesting talk excellent presentation I look forward to reading the book thank you so much so Great. you're getting a lot of uh, positive feedback from the group here and uh, I wanted to thank you once again for sharing your research with us and your work with us today. And to all of you who are joining us and joining Sadhguru Center for the first time, you can sign up for future talks with us. There's a link in the chat where you can um, sign up for updates on future events and programs with us. So you can reach us also at any time via email. Uh, the email is also listed on the uh, screen that you should all be able to see. And uh, we hope to see you in future events. We have monthly events like this. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in ongoing weeks. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. And have a lovely rest of your evening.